So there are 600,000 children that lived under ISIS's control and were literally taught to hate and kill people who believe differently. And so if left to themselves, these children would become the next generation of ISIS, the next iteration of terrorism in the world. Hey everybody, Alex Newman here with Conversations That Matter. And one thing that really matters to me and I think should matter to you as well is religious freedom. And today we have a very special guest who knows all about that, who has seen what happens when religious freedom is disregarded or not upheld and respected. Uh, her name is Tina Ramirez, and she has a bio that we, we could literally spend all our time on. It's just incredible the amount of things she's done. Uh, she wrote a book on the history of Christianity in Iraq for the voice of the martyrs called Iraq Hope Amid the Darkness. Uh, she's written recently just a whole bunch of children's books on religious freedom. Uh, she runs an incredible organization, Hardwired Global, dedicated to uh, promoting religious freedom, not just in the United States, but around the world. She's been everywhere. She's testified in Congress, at the UN, at the African Union, as she's heading to Iraq and Sudan. And I mean, she's just all over the place. Uh, she's also edited an encyclopedia of human rights in the United States. She's got sections on uh, religious freedom. Uh, we could go on and on. She has just done so much. She also worked with the uh, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. That's a, a U.S. body that works to improve and promote religious freedom around the world. She's been a foreign policy advisor, members of Congress. And now uh, she actually have helped to start the bipartisan Congressional International Religious Freedom Caucus. And now she is running for Congress, hoping to uh, join the fun up there. Tina, thank you so much for being with us. And let's start off with Christianity in Iraq. Uh, how did Christianity survive for 2,000 years in Iraq, especially over the last maybe 1,000 years when things might have become a little more hostile? And what lessons are there for religious freedom and, and for Christians there? Well, they survived really by just living their faith every day. I mean, it's it's so amazing. And anyone that wants to learn more can definitely email me at tina at tinaramirez.com, and I'd love to send them the book. And it's just a small little book that I got to write for, for Voice of the Martyrs when I was pregnant with my daughter. And the genocide was unfolding in Iraq. And so I went over there to see how we could help uh, through my organization, but then also to do the research. And what I found was just these Christian communities in Iraq uh, through their faith have lived for 2000 years through literally a genocide every decade or century for the last 2000 years. Um, it's remarkable. It's remarkable that they've survived, but I, there's this one story I remember of, of a, at, I think it was like in the 300s or 400s, where the entire Christian community, like over 150,000 people were just wiped out and murdered by actually the Zoroastrians at the time. And, and in the midst of that, this one woman took her two little boys and went to the guy that was going to, that was leading the murder and said, look, I want to be a martyr too. I can't imagine that, but then they killed her two children in front of her and then put her to death. But the man who did that and had led this entire genocide of Christians, that like one of the first major genocides, he ended up then seeing this vision of Christ and converting and becoming a believer himself and then being martyred for his faith. And I just think you see these seeds throughout Iraq's history of people standing up for their faith. And it just, um, even in the midst of such persecution, it leads others to to see their courage and their testament and it, and it keeps growing because of that. That is amazing. And so uh, I understand you are headed to Iraq. Uh, we won't say when, but you're going there to work with uh, some of the children who were brainwashed by ISIS in recent years. Um, tell us a little bit about that. And, and you've written some children's books. Uh, you know, wh What's the, the focus on children? What's your plan in, uh, in Iraq? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I mean, as many as everyone knows, the genocide in Iraq was just horrible. Christians were given 48 hours to get out of to get out of their their communities and they lost everything and and then when isis came in they literally indoctrinated everybody living in those areas in mosul and the nineveh plains the yazidi community of course was not given any opportunity to flee the women were were sexually trafficked and enslaved and the young boys were used as cubs of the caliphate and then any able-bodied man was put in a mass grave so the situation there was horrendous and it just created a lot of division and mistrust in the community and obviously now with isis defeated Communities are going back into the area, 
but the ideas and the hate that ISIS fueled and the people remain. And so my company, Hardwired, has gone in and began to train teachers, and we've been doing it for the past five years. So even before the area was freed, we began training teachers to go back in and to teach the children religious freedom, essentially, how to value the rights and freedoms of people who believe differently and allow space for differences of opinion and belief in a society that they had been taught you have to kill people who believe differently, and they're your enemy. So that's what we've been doing. The government of Iraq has given us full access to all of northern Iraq to retrain all the children and teachers. So there are 600,000 children that lived under ISIS's control and were literally taught to hate and kill people who believe differently. And so if left to themselves, these children would become the next generation of ISIS, the next iteration of terrorism in the world. And that's not something that we want to see, and especially for these children who, for no fault of their own, were just indoctrinated by this terrorist group. And so Hardwired, my company, has gone in with the teachers that we've been training for the last several years, and we are re-educating all of the children in that area and teaching them the value of religious freedom. And so the children's books that I wrote last year are really an outgrowth of the lessons that we, we worked with these teachers to develop. So we have about five different books that are all available on our website, and they teach children how to value the religious freedom of others. And it's not just in Iraq now. We, we were in Morocco last year with the King of Morocco's special advisor, who is a Jewish man, and leaders from ministries of education around the region, the Middle East and North Africa, showing how this program, how religious freedom and freedom of belief can really be used as an antidote to prevent extremism and the radicalization of children and help stabilize countries that have just been uh, fraught with violence over religious conflict and differences. Wow, that, that is so fascinating, Tina. Now, let's turn for a moment, if you would, to Afghanistan. Now, of course, Afghanistan has been all in the news. Uh, we talked a little bit before we went on about the, the house churches there. Uh, so what's what's on, what's going on on the ground? I understand the Taliban are not big fans of religious freedom. They're especially not big fans of uh, Christians and other uh, religious minorities. What's the status there? And uh, what would you recommend if you were advising somebody on, you know, how do we deal with this crisis? Well, for the last two weeks or almost three weeks now, I've been getting calls incessantly from from families and friends and people that work in the humanitarian field uh, that know that no Christian communities that are literally being persecuted right now that are being tracked down and hunted. Taliban is going door door to door to try to find anyone that is a Christian. And the part of the reason is that a few months ago, several Christian families thinking that they were safe changed their identity on their ID card. You know, in America, we just we have a driver's license that doesn't list our religion, but in many other car countries in the world, you're identified by your religion and your rights are really determined by what religion you are. And so in Afghanistan, uh, everybody is identified as a Muslim, regardless of whether you are one or not. And for Christians that converted and became believers, they want to be able to identify as Christian and marry other Christians, et cetera. And under Islamic law, they wouldn't be permitted to do those things if they didn't correct their religion, and so they did, but now they're put in a very dangerous position. And so Christians are fleeing to Iran, they're fleeing to Pakistan, they are hiding in homes. But sadly, I know of at least one um, group of, of Christians, about 15 of them that went missing, they were probably beheaded and killed. Uh, we know yeah. from pre-Taliban, you know, from pre-9-11, that they were stoning women in the streets. They're already, the Taliban's already gone around raping and forcing um, young children to marry Taliban soldiers. So the situation there is very grave and it's an absolute disaster that the United States has left it in. It's far worse than it was even before 9-11, uh, which says a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. It's just hard to imagine. Um, you're also uh, working in Sudan. Um, you know, my understanding, I'm not a, an expert or anything close to it on Sudan, but I do understand that the Christians in the Nuba Mountains have been persecuted just relentlessly for, for so many years. Uh, they finally split the country in two, but uh, you're heading over there pretty soon. Uh, what, what's what's going on over there and, and why should Americans care? Well, when I was in college, Sudan was the first country I began to learn about with just the persecution of Christians and becoming very interested in wow, if these people, and there were 2 million Christians that were killed during the, the civil conflict, or over 2 million, if they can stand for their faith in such in the midst of such persecution, how can we not do it here? And so it really motivated me to stand in defense of people who were being persecuted for their freedom around the world. And so I've worked actively in Sudan for many years now. Uh, we were involved in helping to implement or to train a group of Christian and Muslim leaders to write a provision on religious freedom for the new constitution. That was post uh, secession of the South, that was in 2012, but now they actually have an opportunity in Khartoum to have religious freedom in their constitution. And it's remarkable that 
that they've come to this point because for for just decades, they have been one of the most persecuted groups in the world with literally the, their own president dropping bombs on churches and homes of Christians. I mean, it's something you can't even imagine. But in South Sudan, in the government of South Sudan, which seceded in 2011, uh, the country is really struggling to develop its own country and constitution. They 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 ended up in civil conflict. Of course, Omar al Bashir in the north really instigated a lot of that. But they've never they've never um, had an opportunity to really build their own government and civil society. And so now it's a lot of work, but I will be there helping train parliamentarians. We actually start this week with our training for parliamentarians uh, and we're working with them to help them understand what their rights are, how to articulate their rights, how to have agency in the country, and then how to teach their constituents their rights so that they know how to engage in the political process and really ensure freedom for future generations. So uh, this is a country with an 80% illiteracy rate. So there's a lot of work to be done to really teach the people what their rights are and how to how to create a culture that respects them so that long term they don't end up in another civil conflict. Wow. And uh, last country in our tour around the world real quick, I want to talk about China. Uh, we have, it, it seems like, very powerful forces and individuals in the United States that want to whitewash what's going on there, including, you know, unnamed uh, sports stars and things like this. Uh, what's the reality in China? You know, they're being presented as this new leader of the, the world and now they're a respectable uh, entity in the United Nations. Uh, how do they deal with religious freedom? What, what's your understanding of what's going on over there? I mean, anyone that's followed China understands that China is not an equal in any respect, whether I mean, it, whether you're on the liberal spectrum and you want to look at environmental rights or the conservative spectrum and you want to look at religious freedom, they are an equal opportunity oppressor for everyone. Yeah. And yeah. It is it is one of the most authoritarian countries in the world. We see that China is now threatening Taiwan, one of America's allies. Uh, you know, they are already working in Afghanistan, picking up where America left off. It's extremely concerning. And I think everyone in the world should be frightened by the um, really the the space that the United States government under this administration has given them to enter into this kind of position of authority in the world. It, it's you know, if. If you lived in China as a Christian, you understand that going to prison is just a rite of passage to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it that way, you understand that, um, I mean, the church in, in China is probably larger than the church in America and most other countries. I mean, it's enormous, but it's underground. It's persecuted. They are constantly sent to re-education camps where um, in the midst of extremely severe persecution, they stand their faith because they know that that's only that's the only hope for their future. It's not in the you know these radical um, atheist ideas that the the Chinese government wants to put on them. But but they do suffer. A good friend of mine, Bob Fu, has even been attacked by the Chinese government here in America. So we're seeing that their tentacles go everywhere, and we should not not take it lightly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've had Bob Fu on this program before. A wonderful man doing wonderful work. Uh, Tina, I want to turn to the United States now. Um, you know, there, I, I think there are a lot of people who are concerned about the direction things are going in. I, I, at least I personally and I think others perceive a growing intolerance of just historic Christian beliefs and doctrines, including by government agencies. I mean, this thing that we saw out of Colorado over and over again. Uh, are you concerned about the direction the United States is moving in? And uh, what advice or recommendation or warnings would you have for the American people and for policymakers here? So I'm extremely concerned. And you know, one of the things that that I'm most concerned about really is is in the past year, we saw them shut down churches and 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 every religious community and essentially treat religious communities and religious worship as no different than, you know, needing to go to, and be actually worse than trying to go to the grocery store or the liquor store uh, because they were treated better than religious institutions. And it's in a time of crisis that people need their faith most uh, for my entire career career really and since I was a child my passion for religious freedom came from the fact that my dad had converted to a different religion and we ended up in these intense theological debates as as a child so from the time I was 11 all through college and it taught me that I have a right to believe what I believe and he has a right to believe what he believes and it doesn't make us enemies we can believe differently and we can have space for one another we can vibrantly have conversations and discussions but that space has been lost in America today. And I'm extremely concerned that as someone who has fought for the right for people of all beliefs all over the world to believe and to think differently and have this public forum where freedom of conscience and belief is, is protected, to now see that space 
uh, really um, come under threat here in America, it's extremely concerning. And not just through COVID, but we've seen in the past few months with just the attacks on social media, the social hostility and bullying that we see. And even in our public schools, this forced indoctrination of kids and radical ideas that are really rooted in Marxism, which I fought against in these authoritarian regimes all over the world. To see that in our country right now is extremely concerning. And that's that's really what motivated me uh, the last year to decide to run for Congress here in Virginia. So. That's awesome, Tina. Well, uh, we appreciate you getting involved and speaking out. Uh, how do people find you? How do people support you? How do people read your books? What's the best way for people to track you down on the internet? Yeah, well, the best uh, thing to do is either go to Tina at TinaRamirez.com or to email me at www.TinaRamirez.com or to email me at that address. And you can reach me that way. But I'd love to share more with you about the books. Um, I have copies of Iraq, so if anyone wants one, to just be encouraged, especially in light of what's happening in Afghanistan right now, um, you know, please reach out. The children's books that we wrote, we are actually working to distribute in public schools across the United States now to really instill this value of freedom for all people here um, and human dignity, because that's, you know, in light of the Marxism that's going on in our schools, something that we need to reinforce. And as a parent, I'm a single parent. I just believe it's very important for us to be involved in our local schools and to in our communities to just push back against, uh, you know, the what we see happening. Excellent. Well, Tina, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for sharing your incredible insight and perspective on this. Folks, you heard it. Uh, go check out her website uh, and and try to get a copy of those books. I mean, this subject is so important. And for decades, it was easy to pretend like that didn't affect us here in America. Well, we can't pretend that anymore, folks. Times are changing. Tina, thank you for being on. Uh, folks, thank you for watching. I'm Alex Newman. This is Conversations That Matter for the New American. God bless you all, and we'll see you soon.